Welcome to the second episode of Flat Police. Today, I, Cycling Graphs, and Naishka will uh, make our top 10 list of best performances in 2021. And we included only performances that uh, is uh, only on uh, 10 minute and longer climbs. Uh, yeah, so basically how we picked this, first of all, is that we both made a separate top 10 and then basically combined it. 10th place, we have Primoz Roglic and Enric Mas on... Alto de Velefique on stage 9 of the World uh, Spania. Uh, Mass and Rockledge did around 6.1 watts per kilogram for 34 minutes, around 34 minutes. So this was one of the hottest days I've, I've ever seen in cycling. I, I, I wrote down also the, the temperatures. They had like 37 degree over the entire stage and then 35 degree on the last time. So that already is quite extraordinary. They also wrote quite a hard race for four hours and 41 minutes before the climb at 14.23 kilojoule per kilogram per hour so still a high level performance in in yeah very difficult conditions i didn't put uh, this one in my top 10 but it would be like probably in 15 or 14th place but yeah it's it's incredible because of uh weather like you said they performed in 35 degrees. What the Spain is happening in uh, in the summer because like Spain is super hot and <laughs> when you are doing a race in summer in a country that's very very hot and it will probably be a very hot conditions but yeah it's pretty surprising that pretty much Roglic and Enric Mas uh, could uh, do so so many watts per kilo but probably guys in uh, Volta Portugal also are capable of these performances, even in hotter conditions, like Raul Alarcon, like he did it uh, like in 440 degrees, his stuff on uh, Senor, Senora de Graza. Uh, these performances are also crazy. I also saw like a heat chart from uh, stages this year, and this was the top 10 was all of Vuelta, Vuelta State first week of Vuelta and Vuelta Portugal were like first to eight or something like that. So these were like the hottest stages of the year. I'm going to shortly explain uh, the kilojoule per kilogram per hour metric. This is basically the best way to measure fatigue before the last climb. The kilojoule itself is a unit that you can access on Strava, which is calculated by like the watts they did before the climb. So we take that divided by the kilogram because, of course, heavier riders will do more kilojoule and then divide it by uh, the time they did this for. And then you get the kilojoule per kilogram per hour metric. I think we are like one of the first or only people to really look at this metric. I haven't really seen it before. We ourselves are not 100% sure about this, especially how it correlates with time. So for how much time, which is better, et cetera. But uh, yeah, so 12 to 13 is basically for like three to four hours. That's like decent uh, fatigue or yeah, normal. And then above 14 for like over three hours, I would say it's it's getting serious. And then, yeah, if, you, if you're below 12 or even below 10, which is like on basically only on Jebel Hafid, that, 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 that's basically when it's like really low. So yeah, we're not exactly sure how much it impacts the climbing performances at the end of the stage, but yeah, it, it's quite a nice metric to at least show show the fatigue, even if it's like not 100% confirmed how much it actually impacts them in the end. Anyways, moving on to ninth place it is Egan Bernal, his only performances for performance today. Uh, on the Monte Zoncalan on stage 14 of the Giro d'Italia when he put good time into all, all the other contenders and a few seconds as well into Simon Yates who finally started performing on this day. The stage was actually harder than I had had in mind because it was quite long, four hours, 38 minutes before the last climb, the Zoncalan and 13.44 kilojoule per kilogram per hour which is still relatively hard it's not super hard but it, it's quite quite decent the weather was quite perfect 11 degree on the zonkalan and they and bernal did 6.08 watts per kilogram for 
uh, close to 40 minutes, so quite a high level performance. Uh, it's also important to mention it's not the same side of Zonkolan which was used in 2018 where Chris Froome won that stage. This was Zonkolan's Sutrio. And uh, also important to mention that uh, Bernal didn't win that stage. It was won by Lorenzo Fortunato who beat Jan Trotnik. So yeah, it was pretty weak breakaway. <laughs> For 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 it's always in the stage. Giro. Yes, it was completely like I, I won't say farmers, but uh, yeah, it wasn't stars who won stages. Uh, yeah, I also wanted to mention he actually broke the climbing record by like one minute and thirty ahead of Gilberto Simoni from 20, 2003. So, oh, so yeah. the good old times when cycling was clean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's like. This climb, if you don't know the profile, it's basically like 8% for the first 10 kilometers, and then it's like a steep ramp at the end. So if you, the overall climbing time basically depends on how fast you go the first part. But yeah, about Bernal, I think he's just really good in like he, he just has great recovery and can basically like do great performance, but not like super peak performances all the time. Yes, and the ne next one will be, in my opinion, maybe the most underrated performance of, of this year, of, of 2021, and, and which one it is? Uh, it is not a world to race. Simon Yates on Pillerhö, Pillersattel, Kaunagrad, there are like 10 names for this climb. 6.58 watts per kilogram for 23 minutes plus. Incredible watt per kilogram performances, but this is one of the craziest stages i have looked at because everyone did 6.3 plus like I, they are like on this climb there were like 15 riders or more who did 6.3 watts per kilogram and more including like riders that you would never expect to do that well like ruben guerrero nick schultz jefferson uh, Cepeda, Cepeda. Yeah, yeah who Cepeda, didn't like, like perform in giro at all like yeah. yeah, like I have no clue what will I, I and that is actually the reason why I didn't put it higher because I think if if there are this many riders who can do so many watts per kilogram on the stage, there must be like a condition that it wasn't as hard to achieve as other performances, probably because it was the second stage in a one week stage phase and it wasn't like and it was also i think like paced really hard from the bottom like i rem remember i yeah rewatched that stage and i don't remember which team set the pace do you remember it was it was Arkea, Arkea with Anacona. yes oh yeah an ironman i think he even attacked and uh, yeah uh, he he wasn't that strong and then then simon yates did his thing before the climb, they did 14, exactly 14 kilojoule per kilogram per hour, but only for two hours, 32. So relatively, yeah, not the hardest pace, but yeah, still decent. And you have to remember that after this climb, like Simon Yates continued for like another 30 kilometers solo and won the stage by a, a minute or so. So yeah, quite an impressive performance from him. Next up will be... Miguel Angel Lopez on Alto del Gamonitairo in the Vuelta a España. Another 50-minute climb from Miguel Angel Lopez where he's just super, super strong. This, this uh, stage was also paced super hard. We have 14.44 kilojoule per kilogram per hour for over four hours. So high pace. They needed that to catch the break break that included Michael Storr, who was also flying, and I think that was the, the KM stage where that, uh... yeah, Jan Hirt uh, did his uh, great pull for, oh, yeah. <laughs> for Luis Mentes. <laughs> that was one of the craziest moments of the season, I think, because Jan Hirt just completely exploded the GC group. <laughs> I have no clue what, what happened. But anyways, for the watt per kilogram on this stage, it's Miguel Angel Lopez close to six watts per kilogram was like six five point nine seven or something like that. I don't remember exactly, but very very high pace for such a hard stage at the yes. end of a three week race as well, and over fifty minutes of course. 
Roglic and uh, Bernal Mas were like 20, 15 to 20 seconds down. Yeah. Roglic like even uh, tried to catch uh, Lopez, but he couldn't. Yeah. This was also like a queen stage of Vuelta. Uh, Lopez also won the queen stage of Tour de France 2020 on Col de Lose. So he proves that he's uh, the, the best climber on climbs that is uh, 50 minutes or longer. Uh, Lopez, like, uh, if, if there would be more uh, long climbs and uh, mountain of finishes, he would uh, win more races. But yeah. Yeah. This was the, also this, the this stage was perfect for him. Yeah, this was also the only Grand Tour stage win for Movistar. And then two stages later, he left the World Tour. <laughs> well, yeah. So today it was announced uh, officially that uh, the third season of Movistar documentary will be released. And probably we will see some details from, from Vuelta, España. Yeah. yeah, that would be good. Even though I haven't even watched season one and two, I need to catch up. Are soon. you fucking kidding me? Yeah, like, I, I don't. You, you I don't use it. Netflix. You like, it. uh, like, it's so good. It's so yeah. good. <laughs> Next up, we have the first mention of Tadej Pogacar, the Tour de France winner in Tirreno Adriatico, stage four, where he won the stage. Just a few seconds ahead of Simon Yates, who also unleashed a very, very strong performance. Prati di Tivo. We have easy run in 12.28 kilo per kilogram per hour for f- over three hours. Not hard, but 6.32 watts per kilogram for 36 minutes plus. So very, very high watts per kilogram. Uh, I think also on the graph, it's one of the highest overall. I think, yes, it's maybe the most, like, on, on the graph, uh, it's the most impressive uh, Tadej Pogacar performance ever, I think, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah. But it isn't so. uh, that impressive because uh, the stage uh, wasn't that hard before before the Prati Divo. And Yeah, it's only on sixth place in, in 2021, top 10. Yeah, some people on Twitter even like uh, reply to us that it's even higher. It should be 6.5 or 6.6. How much uh, uh, Mihai calculated? It was 6.6 for, for, for him. It's like after the race, he had 6.6. And then in his top 10, he had 6.5. But yeah, I've, 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 I checked a few Strava data. I don't, thi- I don't think that's possible. Because... Yes, because if it would be 6.6, then uh, Pogacar would be on uh, Marco Pantani level, basically. <laughs> 6.6 yeah. for 36 minutes, it's... it's, it's if you, if you do 6.6 for 30, 36 minutes, you also don't... You also win by, like, a minute and don't, like... You're, you're not, like, only six seconds ahead of Simon Yates. Yes, and, and also, like, one minute ahead of Van Aert. Yeah, Walt Van Aert also did, uh, like, incredible... Things for 76, 75 kilo guy. Yeah, I, I still can't believe it. Uh, like how many watts per kilo he did. He did like six, six point uh, plus, plus watts per kilo on Prati Tivo. Yeah, yeah. Normalized power, of course, because that is what matters. But still, like one of the, yes, basically since like EPO era, probably the highest. Climbing performance from a 75 plus kilogram guy. Yes, also important to mention that the Walton Art even beat Egan Bernal on uh, Garen <laughs> Thomas on that stage, who I remember like uh, Garen Thomas tried to attack. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, it wasn't successful at all, his attack. And then uh, Egan Bernal also cracked. And I checked, I think it was uh, one of the most impressive Geraint Thomas climbing performances also. I, I'm not kidding. Like 20, 20 guys uh, did uh, their career best numbers, at least on uh, 36, 38 minute yeah, long efforts. Yes, and that, uh, that climb was paced really hard from the bottom, probably. Yeah, yeah everyone, I remember uh, Ineos tried to set something up. Yeah, so, <laughs> tried to set... But like 20, 2015, it, it will probably work like in your strategy. Yeah. 
but yeah, in this modern era after uh, COVID-19 break, uh, Peloton is a lot faster and you can't do, do this thing what you could do in Wiggins and Froome era. Yeah, Ineos fucked up badly on this day. So yeah, fifth place in our ranking. I put this first. It's the only ITT performance in the top 10. Jose Neves in Cien Rampa. I don't even know if it's a UCI race or not. No, it's not UCI race because it's Portuguese championships of uphill. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's the Portuguese, Portuguese climbing championship. championship. But it isn't in UCI. Yeah, calendar. okay. It's... And like, this I, is... I knew 100% you would put this performance in first place. I put in my top 10, it was only in eighth place. And I also I allowed uh, to Naishka put only like one Portuguese rider, <laughs> for Portuguese Conti rider on this list because it's only probably 10 Portuguese riders on this list if I wouldn't, uh, <laughs> if I would allow to do this thing. So first of all, looking at the graph, this is like by far the highest performance, 6.91 watts per kilogram for 19 minutes, 45 seconds. Of course, in a TT, so no kilojoule beforehand, which is, of course, an advantage, but it was also in extreme heat, I believe, 33 to 35 degree on that day. But Portuguese riders seem to fare well in these conditions, or I guess they're used to it. But yeah, purely on watts per kilogram basis, this is on a level with like Quintana, Charlie Renard last year. Yes, it's on my watts per kilo levels. It's between a mutant level and a eight stake level. And like, if you if your performance is better than a eight stake trend line, then it's like one hundred percent you doped. <laughs> Yes, it's like 100%, but I don't know what, what these uh, Portuguese riders are eating. Is it maybe Portuguese molten air? <laughs> like, how the fuck they can perform like so well? Can you explain, Naichka, why Jose Neves did almost 7 watts per, watts per kilo for almost 20 minutes? How it's possible? I think because he's the best climber in the world. <laughs> and but... why he isn't in war too. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess he wasn't that good at, at Burgos. I mean, he was still decent, but he wasn't that good at Burgos. Uh, he also he got said his that chance on he, he said that he wasn't feeling well in the team, I guess, and yeah, couldn't perform to his best level. And why? Why he can perform only in Portugal? <laughs> I mean that. Uh, I mean, he also performed in Milano, Torino, twenty eighteen, and in some Spanish races. But yeah, we'll see. Maybe, maybe he can perform outside Portugal as well if he gets the chance. Do you think he will beat Remco Evenepoel in uh, Algarve? That will be mm -hmm. in, like after in February. The question is if he'll be leader because, like. W52 have a lot of possible leaders. Like last year's winner, Joao Rodriguez, he will be there. Antun William of Volta Portugal will be there. That's the question. And also, I, I think it will be hard to for any rider to beat Avon a pool in this race because it lasts like a 30 kilometer TT. So, yeah, the time made up in that will be quite. But at least are on, on to... mountains, yeah, on, on climbs. Yeah, but there's not, there are not like too many hard mountain stages there's it like foya which is like six percent and then malau which is like two kilometer nine percent so you can't make huge difference on these climbs yeah next up is gonna be another performance from miguel angel lopez another 50 minute plus climb and another not world tour race it is the more two challenge uh one day race which probably helped uh Lopez to achieve such incredible watts per kilogram because they were fatigued beforehand, at least not on uh, days before. Because like, even on the on the stage they rode like decently hard, I believe. Yeah, for three hours thirty three minutes fourteen point eight two kilojoule per kilogram per hour, which is quite a decent pace. But it was on a, a 
one day race. He did 6.05 watts per kilogram for 57.55. One of the all-time best long, yeah, long climb performances, I would yeah, say. Yeah, it was the uh, second uh, fastest uh, time on Montman 2 if we exclude the time trials. So only Marco Pontani was faster. <laughs> so it means a lot. And also if we compare like historic times and what's per kilo calculations, then this one is like really impressive because uh, the, the reason, uh, one reason is that uh, this like 50 plus minute climbs is used pretty rarely in races. And uh, yeah, when two Lopez just did the uh, crazy watts in one, went to one, one day, it was also like perfect conditions. Movistar pasted the, from the bottom of climb. And yeah, he, he went like full gas and basically he did, did his FTP test on, on one went to Lopez. Yeah, he also like attacked super early. I think like 30 kilometers to go or something. So yeah, he could basically ride his pace for the entire climb or yeah, most of the climb at least. So that was a, a positive, I guess. But yeah, still in incredible performances. Uh, performance. And also... Okay, I'm gonna check. Like he beat second place by how many minutes? Like was... yeah, I think it was like two minutes thirty or something. Yes, it was. So in the second place was Oscar Rodriguez from Astana, and he lost two minutes and twenty six seconds. The third was Enric Mas, so Lopez teammate from Movistar. He lost two minutes and thirty three seconds. And the fourth one was Ben O'Connor from AG2R Citroën. He lost three minutes and 30 seconds. And yeah, Ben, ben O'Connor is like great on long climbs. He won a, a Tour de France stage uh, from a breakaway that finished on Tignes. Yeah, he finished even on the fourth on GC on Tour de France. And he lost like three and a half minutes to Lopez on, on one, one day race. It's yeah, crazy. Yeah, I think. The gaps in that in that were were insane. But moving on now to third place, which is the oh, the only performances from the Tour de France. The day the Tour de France was decided, you also wrote an article about that, which is quite a good read. Tade Pogacar on stage eight of the Tour de France over Col de Rome and Col de la Colombière. He attacked in Col de Rome and then wrote. Colombia solo basically uh they yeah it wasn't the stage wasn't long yeah they only did like less than three hours before the climb but at high intensity 14.8 kilojoules per kilogram per hour uh according to uh Alexei Lutsenko Strava which yeah he seems to be reading quite well um Pogacar did 6.42 watts per kilogram on Col de Rome then it is 15 minute descent and 6.22 around around 6.22 on uh, Col de la Colombière, and yeah, on this day she beat all the com competitors by like three and a half minutes, but yes. they also gave up like halfway and through the last time. And how cold it was because I rem remember that people are saying it was really cold, but, but it wasn't that cold actually. Yeah, it was like I'm always hearing the extreme conditions on this stage, probably because it rained and it looked like difficult uh, on TV. But over the entire stage, it was like 15 degrees, so not really cold. And then on Cold Rome itself, 13 degrees, which is also like it's not crazy. It it rained, which of course is is a bit difficult, but it was not like crazy conditions as in yeah other stages in the past. Yes, and uh, basically everyone uh, that wasn't named Tadej Pogacar gave up after Calderon. Uh, like in my article, I even <laughs> said that uh, Alexei Lutsenko, according to his data, did uh, for 20 seconds uh, 3 watts per kilo on Calderon Colombia, <laughs> like in, in, the, in the middle of climb. Yeah, I think I think, I remember him. It was like he was like leading the group, and it was like slowing down. I think I mean, maybe it wasn't even that. It probably was that one, but they were like going really slow because the tanker was like pulling on the front and like really pacing, pacing slow. 
Yes, and they were also attacking each other according to data from Strava because, like, uh, TV didn't didn't show the pictures. Yeah, from the uh, GC second group, but like they, they really just uh, gave up, and uh, yeah, because like Pele Bogacar is is so good that uh, even like the only way how to beat him is to if if he crashes out. And uh, yeah, he even took the last descent to the finish pretty safely. So yeah, he even didn't take that risk as, as Primoz Roglic on a water stage where he crashed <laughs> after his uh, meaningless attack. Uh, but at least Primoz Roglic uh, can uh, get some money from uh, his t-shirts. Uh, he can say he, he risked it, but what, what was it worth it? I don't know. Do you think businessman right decision? <laughs> Anyways, yeah. uh, second on our ranking, Mark Padun on stage seven of the Dauphiné to La Plaine to altitude as well, close to 2,100 meters. He wrote the climb at 6.17 watts per kilogram for 45 minutes an enormous performance from the Ukrainian climber. Also, the stage wasn't even that easy beforehand because Movistar, I think, paced on the penultimate climb and in the valley as well to catch the breakaway for Miguel Angel Lopez, I assume. So, yeah, it wasn't wasn't that easy. 19 degree, 20 degree around that. They did 13.34 kilojoule per kilogram per hour for four hours and 10, which is quite a reasonable pace. Not the hardest, but also not super easy. And yeah, he went solo with like half the climb to go with Sepp Kuz and then yes, pulled Sepp a lot. attacked like in um, on Jebel Hafid stage in UAE tour, but blow up. And yeah. Like uh, it was the biggest what the fuck moment of uh, this year of 2021. Like uh, when when I watched it live, I didn't really know who the fuck was that uh, Bahrain rider. Like I thought it's like Jack Haig maybe. Uh, I like hey I already forgot that Mark Padun exists. Of course he beat uh, Remco Evenepoel uh, two years ago in uh, that Adriatica Yonica race. But yeah, this performance was really surprising. Like no one didn't expect it because on betting markets was like one, uh, like it was one against 500 that he would win the stage. Like odds are like super low, but Mark Padun somehow, somehow did this. I don't know how, <laughs> what's his secret sauce, but yeah, it was really surprising. And yeah, we also had like, beat like the Richie Port, I believe, by like 35 seconds. And Richie Port also with a really, really good performance, 6.05 for 45 minutes. Also, yeah, uh, worth a mention, I guess. So, yeah, pretty good performance from him as well uh, before he basically mailed in the tour and, yeah, then didn't really appear anymore for the rest of the year. And Miguel Angel Lopez finished uh, third on this stage, 53 seconds behind uh, Padun. Yeah, and, and he again showed that he's good on long climbs, but on this 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 one, yeah, Padun was unbeatable. Like I'm uh, I'm really waiting for this season, 2022 season, because I want to see if he can do something similar this year. Because like he, he even uh, performed on the next day where he won the mm, uh, stage from breakaway, and he also did a pretty good watts per kilo on Picon Blanco on Volta Espana. So, yeah, well, let's see if Padun can do this thing on the EF easy post. Yeah, before we move on to first place, we will have a few honorable mentions, which are Jonas Vingegaard on Morvan 2 when he dropped Tadej Pogacar. Primoz Roglic on Superga in Milano Torino, uh, Tade Pogaccia on Col du Porte, stage 17 of the Tour de France, where he uh, yeah, won his second, second stage of the tour. And Primoz Roglic and Tade Pogaccia on Arate and Krabelin in no, Italia Basque Country. 
that that, that was good. Stage. Yeah. Yeah, the Godu was also like decent, but he was sitting on. He was sitting on most of the time, at least. Yes, and the. Uh, I know someone will ask uh, where the fuck is Walton Art, well, why he isn't included or mentioned. Yes, his uh, Mon 22 performance in my list is probably in, uh, I'll check it, it was probably in uh, 557th place. So yeah, Walton Art 22, I won't include in my top 10. And uh, who yeah. is in the first place? It is. I think, yeah, I put this second behind Nevis and you put this first. I also put this first on my Twitter ranking I made a few months ago. Primoz Roglic on stage 17 of the Vuelta a España to, uh, to Lagos de Covadonga and before the climb to uh, La Collada Lomena as well. Before the La Collada Lomena climb, they did 14.24 kilogel per kilogram per hour for three hours and then they still continued to stage for like over an hour at full speed because yeah Egan Bernal attacked with 60 kilometers to go and Roglic first followed then pulled with him and then dropped him off the wheel on the last climb 6.45 watts per kilogram for over 20 minutes on La Colada Lomena and then 6.15 for Roglic for like 28 minutes on the steep part of the Covadonga climb. You can't really calculate the full climb because it's just like small descents, so it would make the calculation inaccurate. And they also like Primoz Roglic wrote the stage, which was a mountain stage and included like three or four categorized climbs at like over 40 kilometers an hour average. It's pretty insane if you think about it. Yes, and also insane it, it, uh, is that, that between the Lomena and Kovadonga climbs, uh, Roglic and Bernal uh, did also some crazy watts probably on the flat section. So they weren't were resting like uh, guys in the GC second group. Yeah, it's pretty impressive that Roglic, he won the stage by how many? We'll, we'll look, he got, got a nice gap on second place. So, so yeah, he won, won like by one minute by 35. One minute and yeah, 35 seconds. And the second one yeah. was uh, Sepp Kuss, his teammate. So yeah, he took some also bonus seconds away from uh, competitors of Roglic. Yeah, when I watched this stage live, I I, I thought uh, the if I'm Roglic, I, I wouldn't follow <laughs> Bernal because like why? Like Bernal was so far... So Bernal at the, that moment lost to Roglic uh, almost three minutes and like there, there's no way Bernal alone would be able to, 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 to win that stage if the chasing group would work. Like you, you, you can possibly, possibly put the Sepp Kuss on the front, on the flat section. And, and yeah. And also Steven Kruiswijk what was still in that group i don't know if, yeah. if it was super smart decision but it worked pretty pretty well from from Roglic. yeah Roglic was basically passive the entire world and then yeah on this stage he just attacked or like followed the attack with 60 kilometers to go and wins by like over 130 and basically has the vuelta sealed in one stage without doing too much work before so yeah in, insanely impressive performance also in the valley like you can't know exactly how many watts they did but they definitely did like 5.2 plus so yeah they Roglic and Bernal still like put in a quite a decent effort throughout uh, yeah between the climbs basically Yes, and also it's pretty frustrating that uh, Roglic, Bernal, and Pogacar isn't like like I would love to see them in one race where, where they are the at the at the peak, but at least it was like this was one one of the rare days where uh, like uh, the the big guys uh, uh, went full gas. Uh, Bernal and Roglic. Uh, let, let's let's wait for 2022 maybe in tour de france day all three will do something something spectacular yeah this was also actually one of 
Bernal's best ever performances. And yeah, he got absolutely humiliated in the end. He's rarely done the what's like he did on La Collada Yamena and then the effort in the Welle, etc. So yeah, high level performance from Bernal as well, but wasn't enough in the end to yeah do anything basically because Roglic was just out of this world on this die. Okay, so let's end our top 10 list of 2021 and uh, let's see who which riders will perform in uh, this season. Yes, I'm still waiting uh, for Mark Padun if he can uh, repeat or maybe do something even better than on Lapline. And yeah, thank you for listening. Subscribe to our podcast and goodbye.